what is the point of life? What is the meaning of life? What are we supposed to be doing in life? What's the key to happiness? These are all kinds of variations of the same core question we ask as mankind. Why? What's the point? Well, the answer here should probably come as no surprise. God. God should always be at the center. Now, I do another podcast. I don't often mention it because Simple Man Sermons is the flagship and kind of its own thing. But I do another podcast, mostly as a men's ministry in disguise, called Alpha Male Podcast. And we talk about all kinds of stuff on there pertaining to manliness, knives, guns, hunting, fishing, survival. And one thing I say in the intro there is with God at the center. Because God should always be at the center. The center of our lives. You see, for a long time in so-called science, for a lot longer than we've had our recent view of the universe, we thought that Everything revolved around us here on this earth as humans. We thought the sun and the stars and everything revolved around us. And superficially, you can kind of see where that comes from, right? That makes sense. You've got people looking up in the night sky and to them laying on their back looking at the sky. The sky is moving and they are still. And the sun sets and the sun comes up every day. It seems natural that you would think that you were the center or the earth was the center of the universe. You see the stars revolving around in predictable patterns. You see the moon moving in cycles across the sky for times and for seasons as the Bible tells us. So it was only natural I think to presume that the earth was at the center of the universe. And you kind of see where that comes from, right? We can't really be too hard on our ancestors for thinking that, but they could never quite make that model work. There was always things that really didn't fit, like the way the planets moved. It just never really worked out the way that it should because it wasn't true. The Earth is not at the center of the universe. The Bible never says it is. So that model of the universe would never work out no matter how much you wanted it to because it wasn't true. It wasn't true. So it is with our lives. If you think that you are the center, that everything revolves around you, your life revolves around you, Everything's about you. That model is never going to work out. No matter how much you want it to. Because it's not true. It's not true. There's always going to be something off. There's always going to be something that just doesn't fit in or work out or make sense. Because the model is flawed. God is at the center. The center of everything. We talked about the universe. This universe and any others revolve around God. He is at the center of everything, of all creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It all revolves around God. He was not created. He is the creator. And everything revolves around him. Every piece of matter, every atom, every bacteria, every planet, every eye that can see, every galaxy in the night sky. And the Bible says, every hair on your head, they're all numbered. God 
is the maker and sustainer of them all. All things were made by him, and all things are sustained by him. Colossians 1 He is before all things, and in him all things consist. So, if hitherto for you've been living your life that way, it's not going to work out because it's not true. I know because I grew up and not a Christian lived my life that way as if somehow this world revolved around me. As if somehow the point of my life was to make me happy. The point of my life was self-discovery or pleasure. And I didn't know it at the time because again I didn't grow up a Christian. I grew up a heathen. There's a name for that. Hedonism. Hedonism is the name for that. And sadly, that seems to be the culture of the day. Dictionary. Hedonism. Philosophy. The ethical theory that pleasure, in the sense of the satisfaction of desire, is the highest good and proper aim of human life. And sadly, that seems to kind of have become the pagan religion of our day. I was certainly sucked into it. People living for pleasure. They make that the aim of their life. Pleasure. And all manner of desires. I was recently with some family. Now, I don't have a television. Got rid of it years and years ago, by the grace of God. My wife as well, when I met her already, had gotten rid of her television. It's been many years since we've had TV. Recently, I was staying with some family, and they had the TV on. And it was one of those cooking drama, I guess you'd call it reality. It's not reality. It's one of those cooking shows. And what just kind of turned my stomach about it was how they idolize this food. They worry and care so much about this food and this different texture and the different flavors. And they make all this drama around it. It's food. All these people competing and idolizing this food and these different ingredients. Not once on that show did I see them thank God for that food. Because where did that food come from? It came from God. There was no reverence for God in that. There was reverence for food. Food. They idolized and fetishized food. It was disgusting to watch. The thing that is a blessing from God that you will receive and then expel out of you. To keep you going. To keep you alive. And it's a wonderful gift from God. Where's the thanks in God for that? They worship the creation rather than the creator. And that's just one small example in our culture. You look at this whole, without getting too graphic, because I want kids to be able to listen to this, this culture that's so bent on and so focused on physical pleasure of any different kind, as if that's the aim of life, as if that's the highest thing that you can achieve is physical pleasure. And this is nothing new. This is nothing new. But we look at it today and it's so in your face everywhere that you turn in the world. The pursuit of physical pleasure. And that's nothing new. We see that in all manner of ancient cultures as well. At least ancient pagan cultures. Rome. Greece, many cultures. In fact, we see it laid out very plainly in the Bible, in the book of Ecclesiastes. We see Solomon there, except for Jesus Christ, who is God, so is all wise, the wisest man that ever lived. Let's look at what he has to say about the matter. And as far as earthly wealth goes ridiculously 
wealthy. Forget about Donald Trump and Bill Gates. And he does this looking into pleasure thousands of years ago. Let me read to you from Ecclesiastes. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine, and while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. So I tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself, and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filled them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and all my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Solomon was a wise man. He tried it. He saw there wasn't anything in it. Grasping for the wind. We see the same thing played out today. And I don't want this to be the case. That it just shows the flaw in hedonism. Look at all these rock stars and movie stars that struggle with depression and suicide rates very high. They die very young. Not all of them, but many, many of them. These are people that seemingly have more than they would ever need as far as money and pleasure goes. If that were the key to life, if that were what was really important, if that what was supposed to be at the center was at the center, pleasure, then you would see them being the happiest people on earth. But they're not. They're not. So why do so many people look to them as an example? Do we not see the foolishness and folly in wanting to be like people that don't even want to be like themselves many times? You see, that's not working out because the model is wrong. They have the wrong thing at the center. Just like we did for so long with the universe. The earth isn't at the center. It's not about us. God is at the center. The center of the universe. And should be at the center of our lives. He is at the center. If you try and build your life on a wrong model. You're going to get bad results. It's never going to make sense. It's never going to be true. You will in fact. In point of fact. Be living a lie. You try and put all this other stuff at the center. But it's not. And it's never going to be at the center. You try and fill this hole. This void at the center of your life. With things. With pleasure. With money. With men. With women. No matter how much stuff you try and shove in that hole. It's never going to fill it. 
because there's only one thing that can, and that's God. And until you restore Him to the proper place at the center of your life, you're going to have a hollow emptiness in your life. Now Solomon, wise, so wise for a man. But let's compare that to Jesus, the wisdom of God made flesh. Let's see what he tells us. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. For your eye is the lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God. Above all else. And live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. That, that is wisdom. We're not called to be like the rest of the world. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. The rest of the world might run around idolizing food and ingredients and money and physical pleasures of all kind making that the center always chasing after the next thing that's always changing but we build our life on a rock on the thing that never changes on God that's a profound difference between us and heathens and pagans and the people of the world They're always chasing after the next thing, the next fad, searching for meaning in life. But we have it. Our lives are built on it, on the rock that doesn't change, on a firmer foundation than the rest of the world. What is the first and greatest commandment and the second? 
What does Jesus say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. It's not about you. It's about God. He tells us how to love Him. How to love our neighbor as ourself. We are called to love ourselves, but that's not at the center. It starts out with God. It starts out with loving God. Loving God with everything. And loving your neighbor as yourself. You see, you're not at the center of that. God is at the center, and then we are around him. Called to love him at the center and love each other. All these other false religions and false philosophies, hedonism being just one of them, they all grope in the dark for this. We're told right there. It's the greatest of all the commandments. We read from Ecclesiastes after he messed around with all that hedonism searching for meaning in life. Let's hear what Solomon says. The conclusion of the whole matter. Probably should maybe pay attention to that. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now finally he arrives at this wisdom. Yes. Yes. The conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. It wasn't about him amassing pleasure and wealth and hundreds of wives and concubines. That's not what brought him meaning in life. That's not where his conclusion led him to find true happiness. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Love and respect for God. What is the greatest? And this, these are not the only two commandments. It doesn't say that. But these are the first and second commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. That's the center. That's the center of your life. That's what your life should be centered around. I often have a saying, I need to remind myself, and I will say it often. This world does not revolve around me. Oftentimes, I will do things that I really don't want to do. Because it's not about me. First of all, what is God telling me to do? What is God telling me to do? Because God should be at the center of my life. And since I've adopted the correct model, my life has been so much better than it was when I was a heathen. You see, I had all kinds of pleasures in this world, and I was miserable. Miserable to the point where I didn't want to live anymore. And this is a, maybe a decade ago or more. I replaced that wrong model, that wrong philosophy. Put God at the center where he belongs. And then suddenly, everything kind of falls into place. You'll still have struggles in this world because the world is against you. To be a friend of the world is to be at enmity with God, the Bible says. So you're still going to have struggles in this world, but suddenly it makes sense. Suddenly things start clicking. Suddenly the world and your world and your life makes sense because you've adopted a right model. You've adopted God. Or rather, you've been adopted by God and He is your Father. And just like your father, whom you should fear, have a healthy respect for, and obey what they say. We are his children. The conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. It's a better way. I didn't say an easy way. Jesus doesn't say an easy way. He says, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way and there are few who find it. But I pray that you're one of those blessed few chosen by God 
So if before or hitherto for, or you just need a reminder that it's not about you. The universe doesn't revolve around you. Don't be some spoiled, insolent child throwing a tantrum. Insisting that you always get your way. Because you're not all knowing. You're not all wise. That's an empty, hollow life. Even if you got everything right now that you think that you want, you would soon be bored and tired of it. And you'd still have an empty, hollow life without God at the center. But as the Bible tells us, godliness with contentment is great gain. In fact, let's unpack that a little bit further. Let's go to that verse. In 1 Timothy, who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing in to the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. You see, despite what the world might have you believe, there's really no correlation between what you have and contentment. There could be somebody driving around in a brand new Ferrari. Brand new. Million dollar car all the upgrades and whatever. And then he sees an ad that the next year's Ferrari comes out and suddenly he's not content with his car. I know people who have these big, beautiful houses, whereas I live as a nomad. They have these big, beautiful houses with many rooms. Far more, like say, bedrooms than they have people. And yet they're not content with their house. They always want something different, something else, because they're not content. Whereas I have been content sleeping under a tarp in the woods, under a poncho, beside a river. I say again, there's really no correlation between contentment and happiness and joy and the actual abundance of earthly riches. You could have all kinds of stuff like Solomon did. And he said it's all vanity, grasping for the wind. The point of this life is not to amass stuff. It's not the person who dies with the coolest stuff wins. You don't get to take it with you. We read right there. You brought nothing into this world. You're taking nothing out of it. So that's not the point of this life, amassing stuff. What a sad, petty life. To think that the point of life is to amass stuff. Likewise, we see very clearly demonstrated in life throughout history. The point of life is not pleasure. It's not hedonism. We look at these people now living their life for whatever they feel like at the time is going to make them happy. Whatever they feel, they've made feelings. They're idle. Whatever feels good. And we get people so confused now, they don't even know what a man and a woman is. They don't even know what they are. They think, oh, I'm not happy now. If I change to this thing, I'll be happy. If I chase after this thing, I'll be happy. They're chasing the wrong thing. And they're never happy. They're chasing the wrong things. They've traded the truth of God for a lie. We see it with very wise people. We see it with very rich people. It seems to have no correlation there either. For God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Therefore it is not of him who willeth nor him who runneth, but of God who shows mercy. You find that in Romans 9. So then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So, if you were one of these people, chasing after the things of this world if that's at the center whether it's pleasure or money or anything that's not God I hope this is calling to you today there is a better way I speak from experience there is a better way there is a meaning and purpose to life it's not you it's God it's not about you it's about God at least Satan come in and pound you with all kinds of 
doubts and worry. Saying you're not worthy, you don't deserve it. You've messed up. All that is true, but none of that matters. For it is written again in the book of Romans, While I was yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And Satan can never come to you and tell you that you're ungodly. He's going to tell you that you are ungodly, which is true. That's why Christ died for you. That's the beauty and the simplicity and the power of the gospel. Simple, powerful truth. It's not about you. It's about him. Again, stop. Stop trying to put yourself at the center of what you deserve and what you have earned. It's not about you. Again, you're not at the center now. Take yourself out of the center and put God at the center. It's not about you. It's about him. It's not about what you've done. It's about what he has already done for you. Not about the life that you've lived so far. It's about the life that he gave up at the cross to atone for you. It's not about you. It's about him. It's not about how bad you've been. It's about how good God is. There is nothing impossible to God. There is nothing too hard for God. There's nothing you've done that's ever going to surprise God or that's too hard for God to fix. That's the beauty of when you take yourself out of the center and making yourself the center of attention and put God in the center. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The first of all the commandments is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Or let us remember, God is at the center. God should be at the center of our lives. Anything other than that is wrong. That's the right perspective. That's the correct way. That's the only way. God, he is the only way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When his disciples asked him, saying, how can we? We don't know the way. Jesus said that. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, at the center, him, him, God, at the center. So, let us repent. And repent just means to turn, to turn from other things and turn to God. Again, because he should be at the center. So let's turn around and face the center. Face God. Start going towards God turning away from those other things that we've maybe put in a place they don't belong and turning to God focusing our life on God what is he telling us to do how is he telling us because love is not whatever we want it to be how does he tell us to love him love ourselves and love each other thanks for listening and have a blessed day